Well, good morning. Welcome to worship at Marie Baptist Church this morning. The psalmist said, how lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul long and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy for the living God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. We're here to praise the Lord this morning. We're here to have fellowship with one another. I pray you'll open your heart and allow the Lord to speak to you this morning. Uh, we're going to have to do things a little different this morning, as you can see. So if you'll take a hymnal, turn to hymn 379. Let's stand and sing, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Seven, praise him, praise.
church. We are glad that you are here this morning for worship and for uh, starting the next few days of what I know is going to be an awesome experience uh, with Andy Cook here and Experience Israel. I know Pastor Bobby will talk about that in a little bit. Uh, So I just want to welcome you here this morning. We are glad that you are here. Uh, If we have any visitors, we'd love to know that you were here with us. Uh, Maybe you want to connect with us or just uh, we can share with you how we'd love to serve your family and connect with you. So if you look in front of you in the pew, um, there are the little connect cards. And if you meet me at the Welcome Center right afterwards, uh, there are the big connect cards. Just depends on how self-righteous you're feeling this morning, if you want to fill out a little connect card or a big one. Um, But they are at the Welcome Center. And if I'm not there and you fill out a connect card, you can leave that on the desk right behind the Welcome Center. And we will get in contact with you about how your family can be a part of our church. Uh, Just a couple of quick announcements this morning. Uh, We had our move up breakfast this morning. Uh, Just about all the food was eaten. So everybody that came to be a part of our move up breakfast, we're glad that you are here, uh, that you were here this morning and that you shared in fellowship with us. Um, I know it was a great time. Um, And today was the day that all of our students move up in their Sunday school classes, if they do, or any students that start sixth grade move up. So if there are any kids that aren't really a part of our Sunday school ministry, uh, this was... It's a perfect time to start here at the beginning of the of the school year um, to get moved up into our new classes. So, parents, I hope you will lean into your kids' um, relationship with Jesus and their spiritual life and do what you can to get them here uh, for Sunday school at 915 every morning. Uh, and, of course, everybody, as Moy always used to say, we're here because of the Sunday school. Um, if you're not a part of any of our Sunday school or our small groups on Sunday nights, we would love for you to come be a part of what we do here um, at Marie Baptist. The only other thing that I want to mention is we mentioned several weeks back that we had gotten some new uh, church t-shirts in. Uh, We're working on some other merchandise as well, but the t-shirts are in. They're in this little room over here, and um, they are now available for sale. We've got kid sizes this time as well, black and gray. So kid sizes will be 10, uh, adult sizes are 12, and then extra large and up will be 14. Uh, So we'll have those until they sell out, and if they sell out, we look at ordering some more. Um, We've got some interesting things coming as well, such as um, some church hats, hats with the church logo on them, and some vehicle stickers as well. That way, when you cut people off, they know where to find you on Sunday. Um, So drive safe, people, if you've got a Marie Baptist logo on the back of your car. Uh, But those will be in soon as well. Um, So we are glad that you are here, Uh, Pastor Bobby, for a couple of announcements, and then Mr. Hollis will come up and pray. I've got to say, I love your shirt this morning. You got the memo, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Okay. Oh, you got I've it. got one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So just very quickly, it is good to see you all this morning. I got a couple of announcements that I want to make. Um, I think many of you all know uh, J.C. and Pat Myers. Mr. J.C. passed away this week, and uh, we want to be in prayer for them. And, and it's kind of a, an, an unusual circumstance. So Mr. J.C. is from Virginia. And um, his first wife there that had passed away, it was his wishes that down the road, that whenever he passed away, that he would be taken back to Virginia. And so they're going to be having the funeral for him Tuesday in Virginia. And Miss Pat, unfortunately, is not going to be able to make that trip. And so what we are going to do is we're going to have a memorial service for Mr. J.C. here at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. And so if you're able to come and just... uh, uh, support Miss Pat during this time. It's just uh, kind of a, a different situation, and she's very sad that she can't make the trip up to Virginia, but it's a long trip up there. But we're going to be having a memorial service at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. And so if you can be here for that, then I know that she would certainly appreciate it. And also, I just want to make mention, um, we've got one of our young men who is right now, he is heading, uh, getting on a bus at 11 o'clock, and so in about 30 minutes, to go to Atlanta to the MEPS station. And any of you who have been in the military, you know what the MEPS station is. And so he's going to be traveling tomorrow to Paris Island, South Carolina, to start his Marine Corps basic training. And so Cam Lloyd, I want you all to be in prayer for Cam. Uh, He's the grandson of Teresa and Glenn Hill. I had a chance to speak with Cam before he went off. And um, he's really excited about going. And uh, you all pray for him because he's... He's about to get 12 weeks of what he probably did not know he was getting into. So, oorah, oorah. So, pray for Cam and, and pray for our military. If you keep up with the things that are in our military, there are some, um, uh, some things that are very unsettling that are happening in our military. And, um, you know, and I don't want to get off on a tangent on this, but um, 
uh, the, the people who would serve well in our military are basically being pushed out of the military. And I had this long talk with Cam about this, and Cam has a really good mindset, and I've, I've told him, here's what you're going to have to expect in there because there's a, it's a different military than it was 20, 30, and 40 years ago. And so be in prayer for him, not only for his training, but he's able, that he's able to, to be able to function in a very different culture than what we have experienced in the past. He can attest to that. Um, so please be in prayer for that. And I do want to say very quickly, is, um, now we're going to sing another song, and I'm going to come up and introduce Andy. Um, but I want to give some apologies here. Um, so if you've got your bulletin this morning, you can pretty much discard that. Uh, it's not going to mean much to you. Uh, we had a little bit of a misunderstanding about Andy's coming here. I, I knew all along that he was coming here on Sunday morning, and apparently that was uh, lost on, I guess, everybody else except me. And so um, if nobody else got it, and I'm the only one that knew he was coming, it must have been my fault, <laughs> so I apologize. Um, amen. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, I just want to make that apologies. That's why we're just kind of having to do some stuff. David, I appreciate you and our band and stuff uh, getting everything together and uh, doing these changes. You have to do stuff on the fly. And if you're going to be in ministry, be flexible. And uh, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Y'all know that, don't you? So uh, anyway, I just want to make those couple of announcements. David, no, Mr. Hollis, if you would come at this time, and uh, Mr. Hollis Reiner is going to lead us in prayer. Well, as we come this morning, we just come praising you and thanking you for the opportunity of being in your house, studying your word, worshiping as a choir. Just, just such a blessing. Heavenly Father, we come this morning lifting up those that we no doubt will have lost loved ones. We pray that you will be especially close to them. Let them feel your love and your grace as they go through that time of mourning and loss, Heavenly Father. And those that are not here because of infirmities, they keep them there. We just lift them up also, Heavenly Father. And we come praying this morning for the program that is in going to be here today, that every one of us will be attentive and just learn a little bit more about the land in which you walk them, preach them, Heavenly Father, we ask now that you forgive us all of our sins and where we fail you. For it's in Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Hollis. Let's stand together as we sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, hymn 334.
All right. I do want to introduce our guest speaker, Brother Andy Cook. Um, how many of you remember Brother Andy from a few years ago? Okay, yeah. So a number of you were here a few years ago. And uh, I will tell you, this is... Oh, I'm sorry. Children's Church. Our children can be dismissed now for Children's Church. And uh, as they're finding their way out, um, again, Brother Andy is... He's going to be here with us, uh, of course, this morning, just in case you weren't aware of that. He is here, and uh, he will be here tonight. We will be starting our services at 5.30 tonight, and he will be here Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday uh, at 6.30. And I want to encourage you to come. I think what you'll see here uh, is going to be very interesting and, and fairly impressive. Uh, how many of you have been to Israel Okay, we've got a few that have gone. How many of you would like to go to Israel? Oh, wow. Okay, well, listen, there's a sign-up sheet out in the back. <laughs> Literally, there's a sign-up sheet out in the back. So, uh, and and what, what hinders a lot of people from going to Israel? Money. It's, it, it's not cheap. Uh, in fact, the cost is a uh, little over $5,500 to, to go on the trip that we're going um, and so what Brother Andy does is he realizes that there's a lot of people who are never going to have the opportunity to go to Israel. And so what he does is he brings Israel to the people. And his ministry is called, called Experiencing Israel Now. And uh, you're really going to enjoy this. Now, Brother Andy, of course, he has been on a number of trips to Israel. And if he wants to share that, I'll, I'll give him the floor for that in a moment. But here's what I want to ask you to do. His ministry is, again taking Israel to people. He's able to do this in the prisons. He tries to get into the schools and stuff like that. And uh, un unfortunately, some of those um, venues do not pay very well. <laughs> in fact, they're for free. And I, he is coming on a, on a love offering. And so I would really want to encourage you as a church family to, to give well this week. Um, if you are going to give, if you will make it out to Marie Baptist Church and make sure that you put on the check or if you put it in an envelope make sure you put it for Andy Cook uh, experience Israel now just something to note that it's for his ministry and we will turn around and we will um, we will send him a check for that but what you give in your love offering um, we'll make sure all his costs are covered here but that doesn't necessarily mean the next place that he goes that his costs are covered and so you have always been a very generous church, and I thank you for that, and I just encourage you in your generosity as Brother Andy comes this week. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our brother, Brother Andy Cook. And brother, if you will come and just share with thank us, y'all give Andy a hand as he comes this morning. You. God bless you. I am, I am so glad to be back at Marie Baptist Church. This is, I, I tell people it's the prettiest church in Georgia. And it's even better looking on the inside this morning. How about that? Uh, we are going to have a great week. And if you'd like to go to uh, this website, experiencesisraelnow.com backslash Marie, you'll find not only the information about the conference that you could share with uh, friends or family or neighbors around this afternoon, for instance, but there's also a downloadable resource there. It's completely free. It's what we give to our travelers when we go to Israel. It's about 60 pages long, and uh, it's just packed with information now tonight when we come back we're going to visit Jerusalem and I've got a brand new resource we have a book table back there by the way free bookmarks at the table I hope you'll take one but tonight we're going to go to Jerusalem and look at the Bible that's inside your Bible some of the things Jesus said go right over our heads and we don't understand like when he said um, and we'll be when he, when he said I am he or I am and people try to kill him, what in the world was going on? Well, I'd like to, like to show it to you tonight. It's, in fact, it's the first time that I've ever done this particular presentation in front of a group of people, so you're important tonight, okay? I, I hope you like it, and I'll be watching your faces to see if you do. Monday night, we're going to walk from Jericho up to Jerusalem with the disciples on just a week before the crucifixion. If you've got any kind of relationships in your life, if you happen to be married, if you have friends, if you work with people, if you go to school, if you're a part of a church family and you're around people, this is a critically important message because right when Jesus needed his disciples to be on the same page, one of the worst cases of selfishness developed right then. And I'll give you the problem 
and the solution. That's on Monday night. And we'll be, remember, at 5.30 tonight, 6.30 Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Tuesday night, let's do something um, really kind of entertaining. We're going to look at the sports venues around, around Israel and around the uh, Roman world. And just for fun, since we're going to be looking at all the sports venues, the Olympics, by the way, were, were underway during the time period of the, the New Testament. So there are lots of sports there. Um, where, if you've got something like a, a, a jersey of your favorite team or a jacket of your favorite NASCAR driver or you've got a baseball cap of your favorite team, you know, let's, let's dress up for sports. If you don't have to. But we're going to be talking about sports on Tuesday night and something far more important than that. And then Wednesday night, we're going to wrap it up with really quite an intriguing question. Can the land of the Bible tell us anything about end times prophecy? Some of the things Jesus said about what was yet to come. This is Megiddo and the valley below Megiddo. Just to give you a taste of what's coming Wednesday night, the valley below Megiddo is Armageddon. First time I found out there was a place called Armageddon, it just blew me away. I mean, it's just I'm like, you got to be kidding. A lot of things in the land of the Bible are like that. But this morning, what we're going to do is go to the other side. Now, I know Marie has a great biblical tradition, and you're, you're very committed to following the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and all your strength. And you know about the Great Commission. And so that's where we're going to start this morning. And I'd like to plant an idea in your head. You've got neighbors, you've got family members, you've got people you work with, go to school with, that you've been, they've been on your heart. God's put them on your heart. I, I need to share my faith or at the very least invite them to come to church. Look, use this week, this conference, this virtual tour Bible conference as an excuse to start that conversation this afternoon. And, and invite somebody to come to you to this, I call it a virtual tour Bible conference. It's, um, it, there's really nothing like it in the whole country. So invite, invite somebody to come to it. And now I'm going to kind of back that up. Let's travel to Israel. From the prettiest church in Georgia to Israel, you can either get on a plane and take about 24 hours to get there, or you can do it in 24 seconds. Which one would you prefer? I know which one's more comfortable. There's not a lot of water in the Middle East. We have so much water, we play in it. And uh, before we get through with this message, we're going to look at what is behind the phrase living water. But first, we're going to talk about going to the other side. A quick survey of some key places in the New Testament. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. That's a big city today. It was a smaller community when Jesus was there. Uh, go to Nazareth today. You, you, your tour guide may take you to this overlook. I love to take my group right over here to this particular overlook, and you can overlook the Valley of Jezreel and see Nazareth. If you go into Nazareth, you can come to this church. It's called the Church of the Annunciation. By tradition, it's where Mary heard that she was going to be mother of the Christ child. But we know that Jesus also preached not far from this church. I mean, like really close. The place was very small. And as he delivered that first sermon... They decided they didn't believe he was the Messiah, and they took him to one of those cliffs outside the city and tried to throw him off there. Um, Jesus would move to Capernaum over near the Sea of Galilee. In fact, he walks over there. Everybody in the Bible walked. They walked everywhere. Or maybe they rode a donkey once in a while. Sea of Galilee is really kind of small as the lake goes, 13 miles from the bottom to the top, 7 miles across at its widest point. Remember that uh, Israel, you can put seven Israels inside the state of Georgia. It's not a big place. Now, Magdala is one of the cities on the northwestern shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. And Magdala, home of Mary Magdalene, has recently been found, like as in... 2008, 2009, I, I didn't know about it until 2015. Uh, Bobby mentioned I've been several times. I've been 25 times to Israel, and, and Magdala is one of the most exciting places. Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene from here. Jesus almost certainly spoke in the synagogue that was in Magdala. Um, the, uh, synagogues are the center of the community. And so in Magdala, what happened is they, were, they decided to build a, a hotel on the property 
and they got about 18 inches down, and they hit some ruins of an ancient building. It didn't take long before they realized it was a synagogue. And this is some pictures of the synagogue, people sitting around the, the, the uh, seats there listening to someone read scripture. But this is the tile work that has survived over these 2,000 years um, and of, of the Magdala synagogue. If you were to go to Magdala, Capernaum, Gamla, Bethsaida, Chorazin, all of these ruins, you'd find a synagogue similar to this. And this is the Bema. This is a replica of the Bema that was found in the Magdala synagogue just a few years ago. And the scripture would be rolled out on the Bema, and, and that's where someone would, would read. And all of the people would come here in the morning every single day, and that's when they would have their group quiet time, you might say. One of the things to comprehend about the people of the New Testament, say any of the disciples, Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary of Magdala, they never had a personal copy of Scripture. Nobody had a personal copy of Scripture. The Scripture was kept in the Torah closet. In fact, you can see that right there. That's where the Torah closet was in this illustration. So every synagogue had a place. In fact, today they still do too. If you've ever visited a synagogue, you'll find a Torah closet. It will be the center of the synagogue. And the scrolls will be brought out and someone will read. And you, if you're there in the morning, try to memorize what's being read. And you have to memorize the scripture. Now, do you memorize anything today? No. I mean, we don't. Why should we memorize anything? It's, it's at your fingertips in your phone or your iPad or an old-fashioned book, you know. Or, you, or you've got a dozen, a dozen Bibles in your, in your home somewhere. Well, they didn't have any of that. And so if you were going to, to ever be comforted by something like the 23rd Psalm, to take one we do memorize, you had to put it in your head. And they put in everything, everything they possibly could. Before a child graduated from what we would call elementary school, they usually knew the first five books of the Bible by heart, by memory. Pretty crazy, huh? Well, anyway, that's Magdala. Now, so this is Tiberius. And all of these communities right along here, Magdala be right there, Capernaum, Chorazin on the hill, Bethsaida, all of those communities are going to be what I like to say is the Bible Belt, the Bible Belt of the Galilee. Jesus called most of his disciples from this area. Many of them were fishermen. So many fishermen, people probably kind of joked about it, said, what do you think you're doing? You're going fishing? Well, yeah. He was, but fishing for men, not for fish. But he called a lot of fishermen. Now, as is the case with you coming to this church on a Sunday morning, seeing your friends and hearing the songs and seeing your pastor and, and just kind of going about the routine, you kind of know the schedule. Look, they had the same thing. They had a routine. They had a synagogue leader. They had their friends. They had a place. They were comfortable in their place. They were comfortable in the places of worship all along the northwestern shoreline and even over on the northeastern shoreline of the Sea of Galilee because everybody in that location over there looked like them, talked like them, dressed like them, voted like them, had the same values as they did. And as far as they were concerned, there was no reason to really leave the location unless you're going to Jerusalem for one of the festivals where you see more of the same kind of people. Jesus would take them far away from their comfort zone, and they would go to the other side. We'll get to that in a minute. This is Gamla. This is Gamla. Gamla... Um, Gamla is supposed to look like a camel, and it does have a hump on it. Gamla, with these steep slopes, was well, well protected, very well protected. And the people here decided, we're just not going to participate with anything with the Roman Empire. I mean, we're just, we're absolutely resistant. This is their synagogue. The place over here under the roof is a, is a, is a mikvah, where people practice ritual immersion. And then you'll come in and you'll see a larger version of the synagogue that we saw in Magdala. It's a lot easier to see here. These people decided it's us four and no more. 
and, and they never went outside their comfort zone. And the Romans wound up destroying Gamla. There's the Bema seat right here. There would have been a table on top of it, and that's where the scripture was read every day. When Abram was called, Abram who would become Abraham, was called to be the leader of God's people, God said to him, the reason I am putting my blessing on you and your family is I want you to be a light to the nations, a light to non-Jewish people. I will use Jewish people as a way, as a, as a people group that will be easily identified forever by their diet, by their dress, by their holidays, their holy days, but I want you to do this so that everyone can see my mercy. And that's pretty much what happened, except people in Gamla and people in the, in the whole Jewish community got more and more exclusive. They built more and more walls, and they, didn't, they did not go out. They were not a light to the rest of the world. They didn't like the rest of the world. And Jesus comes along as the Messiah, and he says, I am the light of the world, and I want you to be a light unto the world. And he takes his disciples, and he begins to train them. And then one day, the way Luke puts it, he said they, they, they went to the other side. Now, geographically, you could just say, well, they went from the northwestern corner over to the eastern shoreline. That's the other side. But there's so much packed into that phrase, the other side. I don't spend a lot of time around Dublin, so I don't know where the right side of town and the wrong side of town is, but I'm pretty sure there's a set of railroad tracks somewhere, and you really don't want to go to the other side, the wrong side of the tracks. I, I would assume that's true about every, it's a river here, right? Well, look, there's... People ask me, you asked a minute ago, what's the number one reason people don't go to Israel? It, yeah, money is a problem. Also, mobility. You've got to be very mobile to, to make an international trip. But the number one question I get, what would be the number one question you would ask somebody like me? Is it safe? Is it safe? I live in Peach County, and we get on the plane in Atlanta, and we fly over to Israel in the Middle East. And people ask me, is it safe? And I said, oh, goodness, no. From where I live, we got to go right through Macon, Georgia. Of course it's not safe. <laughs> Nothing's safe. You want to go to the grocery store, that's dangerous. You want to go to school, that's dangerous. You want to, you know, you want to stay home? Most people are hurt at home. You know, it, w life is dangerous. Are you really going to just sit around and be afraid all the time? Well, anyway, the other side. The disciples were comfortable in Magdala, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Gamla even. But the other side, oh no, they did not want to go to the other side. Let me show you something about the lake. The Sea of Galilee sits down in a bowl below sea level. And it's a little easy to see on, on, on uh, Google Earth. But the wind can come in from the south or come in from the north and it drops down into the bowl. But when you circle around up to the north, um, to, to the, let's say where Magdala was, you'll come in. Here's the bowl, and you can see that it's well below sea level. Here, this is the Jordan River. Not much of a river. That's, a, that's really as wide as it ever gets, by the way. Um, here's the crack going through the Arbel Cliffs. The Arbel Cliffs. That's a wind tunnel. And so the wind is coming along the Jezreel Valley, and it drops down into that, that crack. It's also dropping down on the southern end, and what you get is a washing machine effect, kind of a vortex in the middle, and the water can get very choppy very, very quickly. In fact, some of you are about to go to Israel with... Uh, um, David and Bobby, and, and so when you, when you are riding around the lake and you see the water this rough, you know, they will be the ones who will pray the calmness on the water, okay? They're the spiritual people. Also, I would get your pastor to walk on the water. Surely he's got enough <laughs> faith to at least try, you know. But look, the water can get very rough in a hurry, and you know what happened when Luke says, Jesus said, let's get in the boat and go to the other side, is a storm came up very suddenly, and I, 
and it and it's it's really no laughing matter. The storms can come up very quickly. Um, this year, uh, there was an article recently about something like 23 people have already died this year in the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the people like to swim. They like to get on their rafts, you know, like they're inflatables to float out, and they get out too far, and then all of a sudden one of these storms comes up. It's very, very dangerous out there. The disciples had a reason to be afraid, but they are also thinking about the other side because where Jesus is taking them is a very pagan place where other gods are worshipped and it seems like as they go and the storm attacks them Jesus is asleep it seems like the gods themselves are fighting against them that the devil is fighting against them as they go over to the other side now here's Hippus it's also called Susita uh, it's named after a horse. That's that the people said it looks like a horse, and that's so okay. But there's the path that leads up to it. You can walk up it, or you can drive around to the back side, very easily defended, which is why people lived on top of the the hill. This is one of the cities of the Decapolis. Alexander the Great founded ten cities, thus the word Decapolis. Ten cities that would model the Greek lifestyle for people, and they would invite people to come over. Here's the stadium, the, the theater, and you can watch our Greek plays. You can go to our gymnasium and see the young people um, exercising and learning that the human being is to be worshipped above all, that the human being is the greatest thing ever, or you can worship our Greek gods. Eventually, the Roman emperor you could, you could worship. Look. You can't eat pork anywhere on the northwestern corner of the Sea of Galilee because all the communities are Jewish. Over here, they're frying bacon, they're having barbecue. And as far as morals go, if, it's, if it says no in this book, it's gonna, they're going to say yes in this community. Do you live in a culture like that? You remember the story of the prodigal? Um, two boys, same father, same household. And when one of them gets his inheritance early, it's a great insult to his father. I wish you were dead now so I could just have your money. Well, his father gives him the money, he has a broken heart, and the boy goes to a far country. And I've always thought he needed a passport to get there. But I guarantee you, when Jesus... It's telling that story. It's a parable. It's not history. Every head in the group turned and looked at Hippos. It's the closest city to the Decapolis that any of them lived. It's only eight miles away. If they had a Ferris wheel, you could have seen it at night from Capernaum. And when he comes home, look how connected Jesus is to where people are thinking. This is, again, a story what does the older brother say the younger brother has done with all of his money? He spent it all on prostitutes, which tells you a little bit about what was in the head of the older brother, and now he's going to get away with it. Well, that story's a whole nother lesson, isn't it? That's the, one of the greatest stories Jesus ever told. You go in so many directions with it. When Jesus brings his disciples, there's the water in the background, the Sea of Galilee, there's Hippos, it's not very far. He comes here, and what in the world happens but a crazy man runs out from the tombs, chains couldn't hold him, and he's yelling, and he's strong, and the disciples, well, the Bible never mentions that they got out of the boat. They're kind of scared, safety in numbers, but Jesus gets out of the boat and goes straight up to this man, who really, if you want to look at it from a compassionate side of things, the guy needed help, and nobody could help him. Why do you want to be the light of the world? Because the world is so dark. Why do you want to go out and share your faith? Because for whatever they put on Facebook, however happy they are, deep inside, they're really not a lot different than this guy coming out of the tombs. They need help. They need your story. They need to know about Jesus. Well, Jesus is able to heal the man, 
And what does he do with the demons that are in, in this man named Legion? He casts them into the pigs, and the pigs run down a steep hill into the water. Let me just stop for a moment and explain why it's important to know the land of the Bible. One of the reasons. I, I'm doing all of these lessons from the Bible. And, and if you want to, just try and experiment. Open up any page of your Bible, and eventually, as we read those pages, we're probably going to find 1 to 12 geographical reference points anywhere you open up your Bible. And if you want to, you can get on a plane and go see those places. Or you can use technology to see them right now. And you can sit down with archaeologists and talk about what they've dug up in those places. The Bible is filled with geographic reference points, thousands of them, and they all interact with each other, something like pigs running down a hill into the water. There needs to be a hill, there needs to be water, and it's it, it needs to be at the Sea of Galilee, something as simple as that. I'm not aware, after all of these years of studying this and all of those trips, I'm not aware of a single misrepresentation of geographical factual information in the entire Bible. And I cannot do that with any other religious book of any other religion in the world. This land of the Bible is one of the reasons you can trust the Bible to give you accurate information about decisions you want to make in life. If you want to live with fewer regrets and make wiser choices, this is your secret right here. And I, I, I love that. Now, that's the other side. Now, here's the crazy thing. When the disciples, who were so terrified of going to the other side, finished with this experience, they've got a story they're going to tell the rest of their lives. And this is not the only time Jesus is going to do that. So here's a, 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 an illustration of that. The normal path from the Sea of Galilee, is, if you want to go to Jerusalem, you take a boat ride to the southern end. That would save you 13 miles of walking. And then you'd walk down the Jordan River Valley. If you can see that, there's a blue line there. And then you walk up from Jericho to here. That journey would take you, let's, let's call it four days if everybody in your group can put in 20 miles a day. Now, if, if your, your mother is trying to make her last trip, or if your, your five-year-old thinks she's ready to go, you're not going to travel that fast. So five, five days is more than norm, maybe even six. But it's a camping trip, and there are familiar faces and Jewish food all along the way. And that's the way people went to Jerusalem, and that's the way they went home, and that's the way the disciples had traveled. That's the way Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem, which is just below Jerusalem. And one day Jesus says, let's go through Samaria. Let's go to the other side. And I promise you, it's just highly, highly unlikely that any of the disciples had ever planned on setting foot inside Samaria. You talk about the wrong side of the river. This, this is bad stuff over here. Well, Jesus said, let's go. We, we're going to go, go home this way. It really doesn't save any time because it's, you're going to go through the mountains. And so from Jerusalem, we're just going to spin it around and go into the heart of what is called the West Bank today. The Jordan River has an east bank and a west bank, and the land on the western side has been known as the West Bank. Down here in the valley is a community called Nablus. Been a lot of trouble in Nablus over the last few years, um, and a lot of trouble in the West Bank between Jewish communities and, and Palestinian communities. But inside a lot of these communities, you're going to see the ruins of ancient communities. And in Nablus, it's no exception because this is ancient Shechem. Um, Abram, Abraham came here. Uh, Jacob came here. Jacob dug a well here. You ever heard of Jacob's well? This is it. And Jesus comes to a little outlying village called Sakar, and that's where he meets a woman at the well. And she is at the well in the middle of the day, and you know the story. She's got a lot of broken relationships in her life, and Jesus begins, engages her in, in, in a conversation, and he says to her, if you had asked, 
I would have given you living water. Now, we, um, those of you my age, we grew up with the King James Bible, and we kind of just accepted that Jesus talks in King James English. And so when he says something like, I, I would have, you, you could have had uh, living water, well, I'm just thinking that's the way Jesus talks. But I want you to think about it. This woman didn't ask Jesus what he was talking about. Why didn't you just say, I'd like a drink of water. I could have given you some water. It sure would be nice if we could sit down out here in the shade somewhere and, and enjoy water and get to know each other. Why did he use a phrase like living water? She knew what he was talking about. And I'd like to explain to you, if you don't know, why it was so important that he used that phrase and why she connected with it and why she said not what are you talking about, but she said, where are you going to get living water around here? You don't even have a bucket. We don't have living water around here. There's a certain kind of water in Israel, in the desert, that's called living water, and I'll show it to you. Now, this is Mount Gerizim. You're looking down at Nablus or Sakar. Here's a well. Uh, this land is not exactly a desert, but it is very, very rocky, and the wells are priceless. Because it doesn't rain in Israel for six, seven months at a time. It'll stop raining in the spring, somewhere around March. Um, the showers dissipate, and it's not going to rain again until the middle of November. And then you're going to get rains in December and January. There's a well. Uh, here's a well a farmer is using for irrigation. Here's a sheep taking advantage not only of a well, but a manger. Next time you're thinking about Christmas in a manger, remember everything in Israel is made of stone, not of wood. Um, that's a manger. Now here's a water cistern, a little hard to pick that up right there, but this is in Jerusalem, and you can see the, the green moss all over the place. You know, what if you're thirsty in Jerusalem in August and your family needs water, and this is the only water you have? Maybe we could uh, drop that spotlight or one of these spotlights just for a minute. I want to make sure you see see the clarity of, of the water in some locations. This water, was uh, it had rained the day before in Magdala, and so that's real clear. I wouldn't mind drinking that water. I'd be a little nervous about it, but, you know, you get to a point where you're not nervous. You're only thirsty, thirsty, thirsty. There we go. This water, on the other hand, has been there a few days, and that's what we call cistern water, and there's a lot of cistern water around Israel that you'll see. What in the world are you going to do to make this water safe for your family? You might boil it. You might store it. As a matter of fact, if you were to make wine of this water when it's clean, you could store it and have something safe to drink for the rest of the year. You wonder why there's so much wine in the Bible? In the Bible? By the way, it's not nearly as alcoholic as our wine, but if the reason there's so much wine in the Bible is because of the water situation. Now, <clears throat> here's a place where Abram lived, Abram and Sarah, down in Beersheba. And these are the ruins of ancient Beersheba that they've, they've really done a nice job of restoring. And they also are going to show us how hard it was to get the water. Now, Beersheba is down on top of the Negev Desert. This is pretty much the last large community before you go into the desert. And these are the steps. You can see the steps going down, and they go down, and they go down, and they go down, and they go down. It's quite a walk to get down there. And the, the water vessel you're going to take down there to fill up with water is pretty heavy, you know, seven or eight pounds at least. And you go down and you get a gallon, two gallons of water, and then you come back up with it. And it's heavier than it was going down. Are you going to wash your hair in this environment? Do you know Americans use, on average, 140, 160 gallons of water a day? Now, if you've you got to go all the way down there for a gallon and a half, is your community going to let you take a shower or play in the water? You know, the Bible Let's put it this way. The Bible smells a little differently when you connect the land with the lessons. These people 
they literally went months in locations like Beersheba without bathing. And yet the Bible has in its first few books, in its first few books, lots of instructions about ritual washing. And they did it because they were so committed to the Lord. But again, I'm trying to get to a place where I can connect you with what Jesus said to the woman at the well. She was, a, she was out there getting water from her cistern, from her well. Um, so we're almost connecting to living, living water. Half of Israel is a wild, wild desert. It's called the Negev. 50% of this very small country is in a land where nobody lives. Very few people live down in the southern half. There are these little bushes. We, we filmed this in the spring. It had, it had recently rained here, so it's, you go there this time of the year, those green bushes are going to be on the edge of death. But they're waiting on the flash floods. That's the only water they're going to get all year long other than the very, very rare shower. But this rugged, rugged land is where the children of Israel wandered for 40 years in a land that's got almost no water. It's just amazing that they lived through the whole thing. But that's the Negev Desert. And there's no, by and large, there's just no water in the southern half of Israel. Now, this woman's up in Samaria, far north of here, um, but there's also the Judean wilderness. And so the wilderness is between the Dead Sea and Jerusalem, between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. It also has no water to speak of. And they get flash floods, and they get a few showers in January, but they get less than two inches of rain a year. People don't have umbrellas in this part of the world. If it starts to rain in the Judean wilderness, people go outside and stand in it. They're so hungry for the water. But there is one location in the Judean wilderness where you will see the most amazing thing you could have possibly imagined in this environment. And I'd like to take you to En Gedi. Now, if you know your Bible, this is where David hid from Saul, and Saul chased him down there. But when David, when it was heard that David was at En Gedi, nobody was surprised because En Gedi is an oasis. So right there in the heart of the Judean wilderness, by the Dead Sea, which is one-third salt, you can't drink that. If you drink that, it would kill you. It's worthless water. You can, you can hike, and on this particular side of En Gedi, it's about two miles in there, but look at the trees. You know there's water not far away if you see a tree that large. Not a scrubby little bush, but there's probably a stream of water in here. And there is. Now, again, there's a couple of different ways to get to some different waterfalls in En Gedi for those of you who've been. But I'll take you, this is what's called uh, the hidden waterfall. And it's quite a hike. And <laughs> if you don't know, if you didn't know there was water back here, you know, you would, you would be worried about the amount of water you're carrying. In fact, you have to carry a couple of gallons of water just for yourself if it's hot weather because, you know, it's, it's just it's life or death. But finally, you can get back to the hidden waterfall and you can go swimming. Uh, you can go over to the, what's called the David Falls. That's where almost all of our groups go. Um, and, and there is just water. This is one of the hidden waterfalls. There's just water everywhere. And this water is cold, which is important this time of year. In fact, you'll see people going down from Jerusalem. Uh, it's only a couple of hours' drive with today's technology and today's road. It wasn't like that in ancient times. But people knew about places like this. All the shepherds knew where every source of water would be. That's probably how David knew in Gedi was there. He was a shepherd. Bethlehem is about 15 miles away. But people will go and they'll, they'll go swimming and, and they'll have picnics and they just enjoy the refreshment of the water. Now here's what they call water like this. This is not simply water. When it's that cold, when it's that refreshing, when it's pure, it's cl the cleanest water in the world. It can't get any cleaner than this because it's been purified as it makes its way south. They call it Mayim, which means water, 
Chaim, which means life. It's water that has life in it. It is living water. And the prophets had been using this illustration for a long, long time. One of the most famous things Jeremiah ever said, that anyone who turns away from the Lord, the source of living water, be written in the dust. You see, God is the source of the ultimate living water, clean, pure, refreshing. And, and if you go to bed tonight, are you worried about water for tomorrow? Don't worry about it. He's gonna, the water source will be there tomorrow. Um, here's Zechariah's promising. On that day, living water will flow out of Jerusalem, half of it to the Dead Sea. And Ezekiel said there'll be so much fresh water in the Dead Sea at this point that there'll be fishermen lining the coast from En Gedi to En Engliam. It's an impossible situation. How can you get fish to live in the Dead Sea? Well, when the water flows out in the end times when Messiah comes, that, that's, the, that's what we're going to have. We're going to have living water all over Israel. You know, that sounds like what we read in Revelation, new heaven, new earth, and a river whose waters make glad the city of God. And it goes out into all the earth, flowing from, flowing from the city. Now, if you're going to be back with me tonight, I want you to remember the images of living water because Jesus is going to use this phrase in another situation. So some of that is background for where we're going tonight. But for that woman who had, who had asked, you know, Jesus comes, ask her for some water. She never actually gave him a drink, but she was just out of options. She was so unhappy. And he said, if you had asked, you could have had living water. You want it? I've still got it for you. I came this way for you, for one person. I, I knew you were here. As a matter of fact, she did find it. It's amazing that Jesus would go into Samaria because one person needed hope. And of all people, to announce that he is indeed the source of living water, he makes the first plain statement about who he is to her. You know, that still happens today. I mean, could God have gone to all the trouble to get a special speaker here today with screen and projector and suddenly maybe you're, you're kind of watching this and you're kind of locked in? It could, could God go to that kind of trouble for one person in this room this morning? I guarantee you he can He's done it in my life. Could I just ask you, do you know the source of living water? Do you know that Jesus has got a life for you that's clean and pure and refreshing? Did you know that he's the only one where if you go to bed tonight, you know, think about this woman having to come out to a well every single day, every single day, maybe twice a day. It's a hard life. But with living water, there's so much of it. You can go to bed tonight knowing if I want to wash my hair tomorrow, that's fine. I wash my hair twice today. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just the life you want when you get into living water. Clean, pure, refreshing. And, and you go to bed tonight, he's, you know he's going to be there tomorrow. You go to bed on the worst day of your life, you know he's going to be there tomorrow. You go to bed on the best day of your life, you know he's going to be there tomorrow. And if you go to bed on the last day of your life, He's going to be there tomorrow. You'll never run out of living water, even when your heart runs out of, out of, out of times to beat. I started this message today on going to the other side. And, and I, I'd like to just remind you that it's great to come in on a Sunday morning and gather together and be reminded of why we gather together, but let me just remind you of why we are gathered together. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, he will indeed take you to the other side, and he will take you there today. I mean, if you're a little nervous about what it is you feel in your heart or your brain, what's been going through your head, if you're a little nervous, 
to me, that's one of the signs God's working because he tends to make you nervous, doesn't he? Get you out of your comfort zone. But think about the disciples who went into Samaria. They didn't want to go there. There was a lot of prejudice going on. There's a lot of cultural differences going on. There was fear going on. And yet, by the time they left just a couple of days in Samaria, they had Samaritan friends they knew by name. They had played ball with Samaritan children. They had eaten Samaritan food. They had been given the best bed in a Samaritan house. And they walked away from that, and they kept telling those stories the rest of their lives. Some of you have gone on mission trips. And you were a little afraid about where the restrooms were and what the food was going to be like and the language difficulties. And you were nervous about it and it made you sick to your stomach, but you got on the plane or you got on the bus and you went on that mission trip anyway. And when you came home, you had stories to tell and you consider it one of the favorite experiences of your entire lifetime. Well, today feels like a good day to create a new story for God's people who were commanded to go to the other side. So let's pray. God, thank you for drawing us together today. Thank you for showing us again our responsibility to share the incredible good news of the gospel with everybody around us. God, don't let us give up on that family member who's been so resistant to the gospel. Don't let us live our entire lives next door to a neighbor who knows we go to church without ever inviting her or him. God, the people we work with, the people we go to school with, they may need hope the way that woman at the well needed hope. They may need hope the way that man in the tombs needed hope. All we really know is you commanded us to follow and you kept taking those first disciples to the places where it made them nervous. Lord, take us to the same places. Make us nervous and show us the incredible joy of watching people discover how good it is to discover living water. We love you. We pray that you would Take care of us and see us back this afternoon. But right now, do whatever you would like to do with our lives in this period of, of invitation and commitment. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. It's hymn 287. Take my life, leave me not. Y'all be seated for just one second. I appreciate y'all being here this morning, and I hope this was uh, something a little bit different, and um, I certainly enjoy this aspect. I love historical stuff. I love biblical uh, stories and just the, the geography. It's really, I have found out it really does help if you're studying your Bible to have a map there while you're doing it, because uh, there is so much that relates to that. Um, again, I just want to remind y'all that if you would like to give to uh, Brother Andy's ministry, 
Um, if you would, please make it out to Marie Baptist Church. If you're, if you're writing a check and put on there to Andy Cook or uh, Experience Israel now. And uh, as you're heading out, if you don't know where our offering boxes are, they are right there on either side of our sound booth. And you can just simply drop it into there and we will make sure that we get that. Um, and again, we're coming back tonight at 5.30. We will be here Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 6.30. And just to remind you of that, and I hope uh, that we'll get to see everybody here. Um, Brother Andy, I'm going to go ahead and let you, if you would, go on back. He's got a table back there with some resources. And um, I've, I've got a few of, uh, of Andy's books, and I will tell you that... Um, there's preachers that I know that write books, but they're not. They're better preachers than they are writers. Um, and uh, I will tell you, Brother Andy is a really good writer. Um, I mean, you can tell he does a lot of research. He knows how to write. Um, his books are really, really good. And so he's going to be, be, be back there at the table. And if you would like to get some of those resources, um, that, of course, helps him in his ministry. And I think some of those books will help us as we as we try to understand more about the Bible. But he's got some good things back there if y'all would like to uh, go back there and uh, purchase some of those. Well, again, it's good to see y'all. Let's go out and uh, remember this. There is a lost world that is dying and going to hell, and they need to hear the good news of the gospel. And, folks, the fact is, if we don't go to the other side, they're not going to hear the good news. It's our responsibility to go and tell. And so I would just encourage y'all, you go and tell and let somebody know about the good news. Thank y'all very much. You are dismissed.